Hello, my name is Benjamin Lee, and I just want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 p.m., so we'll begin our presentation shortly. Today on September 7th, we will have our presentation on car street and policy in 2035. For help during, during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the question box and we'll be able to answer those during the presentation. Here is a list of sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible. These are the list of upcoming webcasts. To register for this upcoming webcast, please visit utahapa.org webcast and register for your webcast of your choice. We're now offering distance education webcasts to help you get your ethics or law credits before the end of the year. These webcasts are available to view at utahapa.org webcast archive. To log your distance education CM credits, go to planning.org slash CM, select activities by provider, select the APA Ohio chapter, then select Distance Education and select your webcast of choice. Follow, follow us on Twitter, uh, like us on Facebook, and uh, we also upload the previous presentations on YouTube. Follow us on Planning Webcast. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to planning.org slash CM Select today's date, August 17th, uh, se September 7th, and, and then select today's webcast, Car, Street, and Policy in 2035. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credit. We are recording today's webcast, and it will be available along with a six-slide-per-page PDF of the presentation at utahapa.org webcast archive. At this time, I would like to introduce Marco, who will be introducing our speakers for today. Okay, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're dialing in from. Uh, my name is Marco Anderson. I'm a regional planner with the Sustainability Department here at Southern California Association of Governments. Uh, I'm here today wearing my hat as a member of the Car Future Group, however, uh, and just to give you a, a quick overview of this uh, group, I'm going to go ahead and share my slide presentation. Okay, there we go. So again, um, the Car Future Group formed roughly two and a half years ago uh, when Cadi Rubini at the Planning Center convened a very interesting symposium in Costa Mesa, Orange County in California um, talking about the future of the automobile. And uh, there was about uh, 30 to 40 attendees, possibly more, and uh, this kind of spurned a, a discussion group that's been meeting for the last two and a half years to discuss the role of the automobile in the planning and urban form context. And it, it really goes beyond that because very few public policy groups or uh, agencies look at the individual automobile as a unit when discussing major planning. Generally, the automobile is discussed as flows or in terms of infrastructure. And so this is a very novel uh, idea to put on the table. And Cotty developed a, uh, a program uh, based on design um, parameters to look at the problems and issues surrounding the car. So that's a little bit of the history. Today we're going to be talking about some of the findings and, uh, and activity that resulted in the book that we'll be publishing um, uh, that we'll have more information on. There we go. Uh, so just to introduce the uh, other panelists are going to be uh, Christopher Gray, Principal at Fair and Peers, and uh, Kati Rubini, Director of Civic Projects, Eric Noble at the Car Lab. Um, 
here are some of the members that have participated in the entire process. Uh, Terry Hayes is also with us and uh, may chime in uh, if, if the spirit takes them. Uh, civic projects, and here we go into our presentation. Cars are not dead. One of the things that we looked at in uh, crafting the book and the uh, working group series was the intersection of cars, infrastructure, and policy. We took these terms very broadly and tried to apply a design approach to designing for the automobile's role within all of these areas. In the design approach, you think about problem solving, case studies, and a desired outcome before you develop policy, planning, and data. And that was something we wanted to bring to the uh, planning practice. Eric Noble uh, with the Car Lab is now going to introduce some of the design and technology trends, and then we'll get into some of the wide-ranging uh, discussion. So I should be on mic. Am I coming through on that end? Yep. You're coming through okay, uh, Eric, but you might want to back off the mic just a little bit, some feedback, but otherwise the volume's good. Yeah, that's pretty much the story of my life, people telling me to step away from the mic. Um, look, what, what we're showing here with, with these slides and, and what all of our forecasts show is a, is a great diversity of, of vehicle types and vehicle powertrains. Really, for the next 20 years, it, it, basically the foreseeable future in the U.S. And uh, that means that the ICE engine is going to continue to be a significant part of our of our roadways, as our vehicles that more or less look conventional. Next slide. And by ICE, you mean uh, internal combustion engine, right, Eric? That's right. That's right. And in, in this slide, we see the New York taxi effort, which was recently won by Nissan, but again with a, a more or less conventionally built vehicle. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of, a lot of CNG use is going to is going to move into uh, our fleets. Um, but even the uh, good old-fashioned American pickup truck on the left is going to continue to be with us, even while uh, auto manufacturers like Chrysler, Fiat promote the uh, Fiat 500, which is an A class or an A segment car, which is in the top right. But sales of those will remain relatively small, and the market will be dominated by full-size pickups still and by mid-size sedans like the Hyundai Sonata bottom right. Okay, so what you, what you see here is a, a trend we're seeing a lot of in terms of uh, advanced design exploration, which is vehicles that are smaller than regular passenger cars. Ostensibly, these are to solve first and last mile challenges. Um, sales are still very low at this point, but there's a lot of interest in the design community. This is a folding motorcycle. Many, many examples of these in the market. Um, these sort of vehicles will, I won't say proliferate, but they will at least begin to enter the market for North America in still re relatively small numbers, but we're going to begin to need to be able to facilitate their use in other vehicles first, um, in other words, so these things can be carried. And then ultimately, vehicles like these that probably can't be carried um, might be used for first and last mile solutions, particularly in concert with uh, public transit. And uh, here you see uh, the sort of mix we might have on our roadways. Cars from the 80s and 90s, um, maybe some, uh, f some future electric cars. The Aptera top right was an, an example. The, the company has since failed, but it's a three-wheeler. We may still see some of those. And up on the upper left, we see a European-sized uh, utility vehicle, but now configured for personal use. Uh, imagine all of these on a roadbed, uh, and that's probably what we're facing. Um, with the predominance being vehicles that look like bottom left, uh, you know, 5 to 20-year-old, more or less standard uh, or what we call conventional cars mixed in with these other types of vehicles and motorcycles, etc. So trends for 2035, uh, more modes, bikes, buses, and NEVs. 
Interestingly, I just got back from China. In China, we're seeing a decline in sales of bicycles as passenger cars proliferate. So uh, maybe we're going a different direction. The car fleet itself will be more heterogeneous than today, certainly. Um, I think we all can expect that. The numbers, though, will be in the minority of non-car vehicles. Demand for spacious cars will stay. We'll see alt fuels, but we probably won't see vehicles that are significantly smaller. Profit for automakers will continue to be made by large vehicles. And, and that's simply because they don't cost much more to build, but they can fetch a much higher price. Um, cars will be manufactured in smaller numbers, if for no other reason, because there are more and more automakers competing for the same pie, so the slices of the pie will get smaller. Um, this will be facilitated by advanced technology allowing um, smaller production runs to pay off. And so we're going to have small cars and motorcycles and hybrids available for a market that demands them, all mixed in with a more or less conventional vehicle fleet um, with all sorts of powertrains, natural gas, natural gas, gasoline hybrids, gasoline, range extended, battery electric, and certainly lots and lots of hybrids. Um, I think we lost one of our uh, presenters uh, shows on the phone line, so uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Thanks.
um, hi, uh, to the entire office building in the Southern California Planning Group uh, is down right now, so we'll have, uh, she wanted us to watch a video. Um, it was actually part of the um, presentation, so we'll um, watch this video. I'll send you guys a link on the chat box, and um, we'll see, we'll wait for them. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me now?
Can you can, can you hear me now, Ben? Can you hear us now? Yeah. Okay, Ben, we are, I have it full screen, ready to go. Just need to um, get the sharing ability from you. Okay. So, okay. And then we're not monitoring any questions, so, okay, we, we are ready to go. All right. Okay, let me know when we're back up, Ben. Oh, you guys can go ahead. Can people hear us now? Yeah. Okay. First of all, everyone on the line who stayed with us, uh, profuse apologies. We did have a network uh, glitch go on and actually restart all of the computers unplanned. I do want to apologize for, for being offline that long. We'll, we'll pick up the pace a little bit and kind of get into some of the meat of the substance. Um, Eric Noble, are you on the line with us? Okay. Uh, we may have... Um, yeah, we, I think we still have Eric by chat, but um, one, of the one of the things I did want to go back to and talk really quickly before we continue talking about the streets is a topic that's kind of near and dear to the heart of this group, and that's autonomous vehicles. Um, if any of you follow the TRB, Transportation Research Board, uh, they uh, recently had a symposium on autonomous vehicles in Irvine, California, and we found it a very interesting case study of how um, the technology is moving much faster than the policy and liability issues can adapt. So there are significant trends when it comes to technology in the vehicle. When you think of the intersection between communications technology that are people building into the cars at the same time as the federal policy is to uh, reduce distractions. Um, and so the car industry itself is very slow to adopt to this new technology. But the technology is out there, and of course Google is the, the company that kind of dropped the bomb by 
jumping quite a bit ahead of the usual consumer product development cycle for cars and, and you know, developing a fully autonomous vehicle, which uh, they've already licensed to test in the state of Nevada. Uh, so, you know, we, we, when we talk about this, we talk about this incredibly exciting paradigm-shifting technology along with some of the things that Eric highlighted, but we also have to face the realities of the fleet turnover. Uh, fleet turnover, uh, as some facts here, uh, is now up to average 16 years on the road, and uh, there are some uh, equity issues between uh, uh, different, different urban areas having different fleet turnovers. So we also have the mix of fuel types. We have electricity uh, being bet on quite heavily by the public sector, uh, but the, uh, the market for electrical vehicles is still in a process of early maturity or early maturing. So those are some very significant trends that we have uh, when it comes to the car. Uh, Chris, if you want to pick up where you're talking about kind of the mix on the road and how that impacts the uh, actual planning policies that go into, go into designing our streets. Sure. So what we're, what we're likely to see in 2035 in the future is uh, the increased deployment of technology. Uh, we see more and more use of pricing, uh, access to lanes. You know, this may um, be uh, in experienced as, as real time, additional real time pricing. Um, we see greater access to data so that modeling and analysis can be more precise. And, and as an example, my firm has been uh, purchasing uh, self, uh, cell phone data from cell phone providers, which uh, tracks people um, very accurately in terms of their travel patterns which gives us uh, unparalleled access to data, which we formerly didn't have before. Um, in, in many parts, parts of the country, particularly in Southern California, we see more density. Um, simply the, 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 the cost to extend uh, infrastructure to the more rural and, and suburban areas will, is likely to be very much prohibitive. So we, we see more people in, in more urbanized areas. Uh, another policy trend is is a, a move away from the traditional audio, auto oriented level service, which which clearly has happened already, uh, and is going to continue to be so. So that congestion is not going to be the the limiting factor uh, for future development that it once be. And then finally, uh, we see very much a, a demand towards uh, people viewing um, mobility as a service, uh, similar to a cell phone, perhaps such that um, we see people wanting to have mobility and, and wanting to have mobility options. And, and this is very much um, could be evidenced in, in the insurance industry, where the insurance industry is now deploying in, in some states pay as you drive insurance, where you pay for the insurance that you use as you're driving. Um, this will be uh, counterbalanced by the risk adverse nature of the insurance industry, so it will be uh, very much an, an issue moving forward. I will now turn it over to Terry. Terry, Terry, I'd like to jump in really quickly and just talk about the, the two areas that uh, Chris left off on, level of service and uh, information technology and mobility, and give you just a few really quick regional examples. Uh, here in uh, the SCAG region, we're working with LADOT on reforming their level of service process, and it, it becomes a very arduous legalistic process uh, well past the time when the technology is available to crunch the numbers. Um, and so uh, we're following the example of San Francisco, which recently went through a massive overhaul of how they do level of service, and, uh, and, and they're really kind of leading the edge. But um, as we see this more fine-grained analysis, it's going to require a, a local body that's going to accept that and basically accept the underlying assumption that um, the car travel isn't, doesn't have to be impeded all the time or, or, or can be impeded uh, for the benefit of other modes. And so that's the fundamental political decision that, that still needs to be made. Thanks, Marco. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about one of the socioeconomic factors that tempers our view of the future in terms of looking at the car. What, what you see in front of you is a bar chart based on a, a mini survey we did in the Southern California area of um, local shopping areas. And one of the things that is important to understand from this chart as we look from uh, left to right in terms of the, the names of the locations, Inglewood, Compton, Culver City, Pasadena, and Westwood. These are, these communities have differing levels of um, 
socioeconomic status and, and, and income with their lower levels being on the Inglewood Compton side and the higher levels being in Palos Verdes and Westwood. The important thing to, to think about as, as we look at the, the future of the car is the retention of vehicles in um, different socioeconomic environments. As, that, as you can see, the larger proportion of older vehicles, and, and probably not surprisingly, is in the lower socioeconomic areas. The problem becomes, as we start to think toward the future, is that the technology for the, the, the higher technology associated with automobile use uh, is focused primarily on the high-end vehicles. Uh, when we talk about the BMWs and the Mercedes and, and those types of vehicles, and, and you can see as the cars are older in certain neighborhoods that these types of technology aren't going to be passed through as rapidly. So there's a real serious question in front of us if it's, as, as to how the legacy vehicles are treated as we move toward the future. Back to Chris. And so the, the issue of legacy vehicles is, is a critical one in the design of our roadways. And so as part of this exercise, we uh, went through a very intensive design process to, to look at a number of what ifs. And so uh, on this first slide here, we want to show you just a typical roadway. This is a typical roadway in Orange County, California. And, you know, this is, um, you know, an example, the, the slide before was an example of a typical roadway. And, and, and we oftentimes, you know, the roads that we drive on on a daily basis, a, a lot of them are alike. You're, most of the time, the travel lane is about 12 feet, 10 to 12 feet wide. Um, you know, two-lane roads are common in residential areas. Four to six-lane roads are common. Um, you know, oftentimes they're collectors, arterials, and, and, the, and then there's freeways, and those are the, the roads that most people travel on. The, the challenge is that every car currently is essentially the same, whether it's made by a different company or it looks different or it paints different. Every car is driven by a person. Um, the cars oftentimes have very similar performance characteristics, and we have a very homogeneous vehicle fleet. But what we've shown you in 2035 is there are some very significant technology and market trends which is going to change that. So as an example, the exercise we took was we took a typical suburban arterial roadway and said, well, what, what might that look like? What, uh, for example, could we have an autonomous vehicle lane? And what we found in this example was it was very difficult to put in a, um, on a, even a roadway where we had four or six lanes of travel or we had a, uh, a 60 foot curb to curb width or 70 foot curb to curb width, which is very common, it was incredibly challenging to put in an autonomous vehicle lane, particularly uh, once we started allocating space for bicycles, potentially for transit vehicles, uh, uh, turning movements as well. And the challenge is that the benefits of the autonomous vehicles um, mainly accrue or occur when they're in lanes to themselves. So once you take an autonomous vehicle and put it in a lane with only autonomous vehicles, the vehicles can follow very closely, they can travel at higher speeds, you can get much higher capacities uh, because there, there is enough um, safety features built into these cars that you can really maximize their performance. However, when you're mixing in the legacy vehicles, which we've shown you aren't going anywhere and are going to be around for a while, um, so the challenge for us was essentially how does the autonomous 2035 Mercedes commingle in a lane um, with a, a 2010 Cadillac Escalade? So as, as, and, and we, we did this exercise not just on the arterials, but for example, how might this work in a, in a residential area? And one concept we had was there may just simply be um, lanes where uh, the traffic commingles, whether it's a personal mobility device, bicycle, uh, a medium-sized truck, a passenger car, um, that vehicle, is, those vehicles are all intermixed. Uh, so that's clearly one uh, one potential option for this as well. The, 
the uh, the other option within a residential street would be to create these prioritized lanes and if and if we do see the widespread deployment again of these personal mobility devices and, and examples might be the segways or the the folding motorcycles or even electric bicycles and the like it, is creating dedicated lanes for them the the challenge for this is for this scenario if you have dedicated lanes is is can you really uh, efficiently or, or how would drivers react to uh, someone segregating a lane on a residential street which is usually not which is not something they're used to um, to, to, to allocate lanes for these devices the, the challenge too is that with a with a with a heterogeneous vehicle fleet it is will have a discrepancy in speed so a personal mobility device that might go no more than 10 miles an hour uh, being intermixed with a car that could go um, zero to 100 miles an hour, and, and there's some significant safety implications for that. Uh, next slide, Marco. So then, um, with that being said, we, we, we've looked at other scenarios and, and perhaps a, a bi-directional lane where people can uh, travel in um, both ways, similar so there's similar to a, a two-way bicycle lane uh, for the personal mobility devices, where we really segregate the personal mobility devices again because of their lower speed from the vehicles. And so that, this just illustrates the the variety of options that can that can be found in the future uh, as we have a more heterogeneous uh, vehicle fleet uh, going from from not just the arterial uh, but also to the residential street. The one of the more challenging and interesting exercises is to also carry this this thought through on the highways, and and to illustrate the importance of this, um, I wanted to speak for a minute about the typical highway design process, where where there's planning and there's analysis done, and and for example, in Southern California, there are um, you know a freeway might take you know 10 years to plan, uh, plan and design. Um, and, and upwards of, of that long to acquire the right of way, build the freeway, make the freeway oper operational. So you're looking at improvements that that have, you know, lead times that might be decades long. And so, so we thought, for example, that that the freeway might be the easiest um, facility to plan and design for. However, it became very challenging. So, for example, um, if we were to take an HOV lane on a freeway or take one of the lanes away and say okay, this is now an autonomous vehicle lane, the, the difficulty then becomes, well, how do they get out of that lane? How do you link that autonomous vehicle lane with an off-ramp? How do you merge them onto the off-ramps? And so on the freeway main lines in between interchanges, it became, um, it was fairly simple to set lanes aside, but once we started uh, planning through how the various connections would be made it became much more it became much more problematic the the uh, result of this exercise led us to realize that that integrating these autonomous vehicles into the roadway network is is not going to be easy is not going to be straightforward it's going to be extremely challenging and so it's going to be difficult uh, we believe it's going to be incredibly difficult for um, these um, vehicles and these types of vehicles to be integrated into the transportation system over the next 20 years. The, the additional challenge is posed by the long lead times and we think some of the socioeconomic um, challenges in that the ability to go in and, and retrofit freeways and, and large roadways at a, at a very broad level is going to be difficult uh, because of the lack of resources at the federal, state, and local level so that um, we urge folks to begin thinking now about the autonomous vehicles, thinking now about the design, and as vehicles are designed, as these facilities are designed, to think through how are we going to be accommodating these vehicles when they are there. Uh, Chris, I'm going to jump in here. This is Marco. Um, some of the interesting conversation that happened around this concept of design of roadways at the uh, TRB Autonomous Conference. Uh, went back and forth on some 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 uh, important ma matrices and one of which is uh, risk and complexity and one of the interesting questions that's still very prevalent in this mix of vehicles and this, this level of autonomy 
is uh, within a slow speed environment, you have much higher risk, but you have less complexity of error, but rather you have more need for sensitivity of the environment. In the high speed environment, you actually have quite a bit of complexity of variables, but some key variables are, are removed from the equation being uh, the direction and the, uh, the kind of um, the range of speed, not necessarily the absolute speed. And so there's two parallel systems of thought that are actually at play. The Google model is developing a fully autonomous vehicle that will control itself and sense its environment. Uh, and uh, currently, in testing, the, the Google people that are allowed to use the vehicle on a regular basis generally describe a commute where they drive to their local freeway, get on the freeway, get generally into their lane, and the car takes over for most of the freeway driving. They call it hands-off, feed-off. Uh, and so uh, that's the benefit of the, of the high-speed environment is that everyone's going in the same direction. And so for the current rollout, that seems to be the preferred method. Uh, but the other paradigm is that uh, autonomy, and this is full autonomy straight out of the box. The other paradigm is in the car and the vehicle manufacturing model where they like to add incremental features to keep production steady and also not to scare off consumers. And so they see it as an um, agglomeration of different available technologies. Uh, and, and some of the car designers I spoke with said, you know, there are these two models. And, and the fact is the, um, the, it, it may actually be two different engineering paradigms. So, uh, so whereas the cars, what they're going to be introducing over the, as soon as the next five to ten years, uh, in 2017, Mercedes will be available with something called Jam Assist, which is basically hands-off, feed-off driving, but only within kind of traffic jam scenarios. And they're trying to figure out a way to keep to force you to stay engaged. So, in the Mercedes example, you have to touch the steering wheel every 15 seconds to stay engaged. So. Now when you start to tease the actual applications out, you see that we're talking about two mental paradigms. One is how do you sit in a car and it takes you where you need to go. The other one is how do you make your car closer to um, sitting there but still having you engaged. So the, the highway scenario really is, is kind of a test bed uh, and, and, I, and, and the thinking is still generally likely that, um, that a full autonomy will avail, be available as a mode within highway driving even from the, the automaker's point of view, before it's available as kind of a, a way to be in your car on, the, on a neighborhood street. And then the complexity of that is, as we've talked before, is the legacy vehicle. So you may have a, um, a certain, you know, multiple technologies of autonomous vehicles or assisted autonomous vehicles on the same time as a, a maybe a truck, uh, a, a large truck, which may or may not be autonomous, a, a number of passenger cars. So the, the discussion needs to consider all of these vehicles, all types of technologies, and what we really need to plan for in the next 20 years, we think, is this very messy, very complex environment where all these vehicle types are found, um, as opposed to the environment where they've worked everything out. So, and. You know, again, we've in addition to the freeways and the residential streets, we we've thought through. Well, what's a, you know, what are some other scenarios for for roads of the future? And, and an example, uh, this is just another example for a a, a community um, where there might be relatively low auto ownership per household. This is this is um, could be an extension of what's happening today. Um, one example we want to. Talk, another issue that we, we've talked about is could the uh, ownership paradigm for cars change? Essentially, most people um, own their cars or have some kind of financing mechanism, but their car is their car. Um, we discussed in our group, might a model like cell phones, where you um, use the car on a short-term basis, you turn it back in, you're, you're, you're owning the car differently than today, or as is starting to be uh, something like a zip car or a, uh, you access the car as you need it. So in an environment where fewer people have cars and families only have the cars they need when they need it, um, we don't need roadways which are which are as wide as they are today or, or we need any or we need as many lanes as we do. Uh, next slide. So uh, another option is in and again, this, this illustrates the high degree of uncertainty. Uh, we could be in a scenario where 
Uh, perhaps there's as many cars as are available to most families, or there, there's even more cars. Uh, another potential trend is the, there can be changes in auto manufacturing, and, and if cars are made um, cheaper or, or there's a greater heterogeneity, you might have families that have a, a commuter car, a personal mobility device, uh, multiple short lane directed cars, and under that circumstance, uh, you know, you may find houses that have five or six cars per person or five or six vehicles, I'm sorry, per household. And under that, uh, we would actually need some, you know, a, a, a very flexible transportation network, which is accommodating uh, potentially a large number of passenger vehicles, even in a residential area, uh, commingling with bikes, electric bikes, personal mobility devices, um, delivery vehicles, and the like. Uh, because another trend that's happening is the the proliferation of delivery vehicles is not going anywhere. If anything, it's going to be increasing as, as more people shop at home, as, as there's a greater need to, to distribute goods and services within our communities. So we see the need to, uh, under this scenario, to potentially accommodate even more vehicles than we have today. Next slide. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Cardi Rubini, and I'm the Director of Civic Projects. And um, Civic Projects is uh, a nonprofit organization that initiates and develops projects around um, uh, a mixture and uh, kind of cross-pollination of professional, um, unusual, uh, unexpected professional expertise. Um, before uh, we take uh, viewer questions, we wanted to just underscore uh, the questions that we're um, grappling with in uh, the Car Future Group. Um, the primary one being, how will we handle the new mix of cars on our roads? And this kind of sets the stage for um, the, the uh, investigations and the discussions that we've been having over the past um, year or two. Um, and. The next question, the other question, um, has to do with the cars themselves, uh, which is, um, will they be, hold on just a second, I'm sorry. Will they be members of the family or will they be uh, generic? Um, this, uh, in reference to the, um, the, the new uh, leasing and uh, car sharing models that um, we were talking a, a bit about before. Um, this idea that in the future we'll uh, be able to access a, a wide variety of uh, different types of cars according to uh, our specific needs at any given time. Um, so those are uh, two big questions that don't have any uh, simple answer. Um, next slide. I wanted to let everyone know that uh, we go into these topics in more detail in a book that's going to be coming out in the winter of 2013 called The Car in 2035. Um, and uh, we can talk about that more um, after we, we get your questions and we can discuss uh, what we do in, in this book um, and the, the objective, the broader objectives of that. Um, so, I wanted to, uh, really quickly, we're just going to go around the four speakers here. I think we did lose Eric Noble, unfortunately. Um, no, Eric's on. Oh, uh, back. Eric, you back? Yeah, I've been on. I just, I just muted because uh, I'm in an environment where there's too much background noise. Apologies. Great. Uh, I call my kids background noise, too. Uh, the, uh, the <laughs> I wish it was my kids. <laughs> The big questions that I'm thinking of at the regional level, uh, one of the things that uh, keeps coming up is if this ownership model develops, and of course recognizing that across the country there, we'll see every single type of permutation of these patterns. So there's, there's, there's no model that's going to fit uh, Indiana the same way it fits uh, uh, California or even within the Skag region or within one of our larger cities. So uh, the question is if everyone's uh, owning fewer cars, but they're in more constant rotation, what will the absolute number of vehicles on the roadway being driven BMT and therefore polluting or not polluting be? And uh, there's no quick, easy answer for that. Uh, I'm not a modeler, but I'm sure it'll employ someone for, for years to come. Um, 
So that's uh, one of the big questions that comes out of this uh, from my perspective. Harry? Well, look, what, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that the life cycle for a vehicle is about half a dozen years, and that's after it goes into production. The planning window for a vehicle is half a decade. So um, the, the new vehicle that is going to come into the mix, even as it employs new technologies or even as it enjoys new forms of ownership or non-ownership, um, that change to our total fleet is going to happen almost glacially because we're looking at really a, a dozen years um, f for an entire vehicle to cycle over. In other words, we've got five or six years to plan it, and then it's on sale for another five or six years. So if we start talking about even uh, t today, 2025, we, we need to realize that the vehicles for 2017 for North America and for the rest of the world are already basically planned. And so we, we, we and those vehicles are, are going to be essentially completely conventional. We work on those, so we're well aware of that. So the next cycle of vehicles basically that can be planned are, will be planned in 2018. Um, and those vehicles probably won't come out until 2025. Um, and these will only be incremental um, to incremental or replacement to our total vehicle fleet in the United States. So again, to underscore the point of how diverse the vehicle fleet is going to be, potentially we have the ability for fully autonomous vehicles to be planned in probably the 2020s at a commercial level um, or, the, or at a private vehicle level, yet those vehicles would come out in very, very small fractions of our total vehicle fleet. Eric, what, in, the, in the spirit of kind of what's, what's a big question that's out there in your field right now that uh, has kind of multiple answers uh, that, we, that, that you'd like to share? Well, one of the things that, that has recently been news again is the increased CAFE standard, which is going to push CAFE, corporate average fuel economy standards, up toward 40, 50 miles a gallon by 2025. And frankly, most car makers are absolutely uncertain how they'll achieve that. But I, I think it will end up being a mix of vehicles. So they'll have a slightly, uh, each of them will do it in different ways. Some will make more small vehicles. Some will make uh, fewer of the very thirstiest vehicles. Others will rely completely on hybrids. Others, like Nissan, are going to continue to bet on battery electric or plug-in. Um, others will probably go very heavily toward natural gas. Um, so much like you talked about regionally, we could have different answers for Indiana. We could have different answers for General Motors and Toyota and Chrysler Fiat in terms of the way they want to mix their fleets for 2025, 2035. Um, that's all completely up in the air for the automakers. Nobody yet believes that there's one single direction. That's great. Thanks, Eric. Terry, uh, what's your big question that's uh, being teased out in this research? I think the big question uh, from the standpoint of you know local communities and neighborhoods is the issue of the equity and the social equity of this technology and the access to the technology as, as time passes. I mean, we, we talk very blindly about technology being available, uh, or, you know, different types of cars, autonomous cars, whatever, but keep in mind in, in that these legacy vehicles uh, and, and the folks who drive them, and I think we have to be very careful to, to understand that there are actually people in these cars, and they have different socioeconomic status, they have different geospatial locations, and it could well be that the people that need to travel the most in the future have access to the vehicles with the least amount of technology, um, given, given the way things in the urban environment and suburb environment are changing today. Yeah, and I, uh, when Eric has talked about the lead time, I, I just want to make sure everyone's aware of the lead time for, for transportation facilities for roadways and, and, and talking about road improvements that take decades to, to plan and design and build is, is not an exaggeration, particularly at the, you know, for the very large regional infrastructure. So, from, so in the context of 2035, in many communities, we're looking very likely at the, the roads that are there today are going to very much be the roads that you'll find in the future. 
however we may be able to restripe them, maybe change them, but fundamentally the streets will very much look the same. So with all this heterogeneity, um, which may which may be found in some communities, not in others, um, we're we our ability to make significant changes to our transportation system are going to very much be limited. Before we go to questions, there was a question that, that we've talked about, Chris, and uh, that is. Uh, both of us have background in transportation planning, which uh, combines the reality of what a road looks like with uh, a lot of data modeling and assumptions and, and all kinds of uh, policy procedures and steps. A lot of that long lead time we can acknowledge is based on environmental clearance planning, not necessarily in the, the resurfacing. We're talking just about resurfacing. So what do you think the future of the actual technical craft of transportation modeling is, uh, is going to be impacted or, or will have to change to accommodate? Well, I, it, for many of the tools we use, the, the capability to, to model the effect the autonomous vehicle is there. Uh, in many cases, it's, it's done through looking at the, the capacity. Um, I, for example, would suggest that if we are, if we are working on large regional projects, we, shouldn't, we should be looking at least at a very general level of do we have solutions that could work uh, for this scenario. And, and I'll, I'll give you a brief example. We see a very significant capacity increase for autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles on freeway lanes. But if those people on the freeway can't get off the freeway or can't get through an intersection or a ramp, then you may not see the capacity benefit. Um, but I'd also like to, I want to touch on something that Terry mentioned about, uh, particularly about social equity. In many instances, the facilities that we're looking at could be retrofits. And I would, I would just posit the question, and this has happened um, in particular with toll lanes, and that when communities have looked at, for example, converting HOV lanes to toll lanes, they're often derisively called Lexus lanes or, or they're attacked on equity grounds. And, and think through if, if a, a region is looking at building some lanes or facilities for autonomous vehicles, they could be very expensive because they're retrofits, and within the region they could be challenged as, is that the best and highest best use of our resources? Okay, um, we're going to uh, kick over to our organizer and see if we have any uh, questions. Okay, there are a bunch of questions in the question box. Um, let me go ahead and... Uh, uh, ben, sorry to everyone inside baseball here. How do I uh, get to the question box? Um, it's under the audio and the polls. The chat? Uh, right above it, yeah. Okay. Um. Sorry, everyone. We'll be with you in just one second. Uh, you know what? I, what I'll do is before kicking off the questions, we'll just uh, kind of uh, wrap up a, a little bit and just thank everyone for for uh, you know participating in in this kind of informational part of it. Um, and uh, man, sorry, sorry, Ben. I'm, I'm having trouble finding it. Can I can I see it? It's signed in the way I'm so I am. Why don't I stop sharing and then? Um, you can uh, you can take over. Okay. Uh, we had a couple questions about um, autonomous vehicle. Uh, could you explain more about those? Okay, I'll take that as well. And then Ben, if you can figure out how to show the question box on the screen, yeah. so so we can see it, that would be great. Um, okay. So. Autonomous vehicles, very quickly, uh, this is kind of getting to what we were talking about, is, is you know, you, you, you can popularly call the Google car, and uh, right now there are a number of levels of autonomy, and, and there are a few kind of taxonomies that have been de developed that would range from different stages of semi-autonomous, and this would be the idea of features introduced into uh, existing cars, like Eric mentioned, over the next uh, probably more like 10 years for, for these types of features that would allow you to, to um, control less of the vehicle. And this is what's referred to as hands-off, feed-off, would be kind of the highest level of this where uh, you still have to pay attention, but the car is uh, pretty much driving itself. Um, then uh, 
the Google model is full autonomy, where the car is really completely operating itself. And uh, Eric, I'd be interested in your comment on this. Something I overheard at the conference was the car maker saying, "Well, we don't really, you know, we're kind of Google kind of, uh, you know, upsetting the card here because if Google were to partner with some kind of manufacturer that could figure out the rules of producing a vehicle, that's a huge if." Uh, they could introduce a paradigm-changing model for, for some kind of application. And so what do you think the likelihood of that kind of, uh, you know, product being released that, like you said, maybe in small amounts, but could be like an iPad and have a fundamental influence on every other product? Well, look, one of the things that, that we have to understand is usually in life when we see things as, as revolution on the surface, underneath it's actually evolution. And so from from the standpoint of within the auto industry, autonomy has been creeping into cars for a long time. Whether or not most of us know it or would even like it, most cars sold today are already drive-by-wire. Um, and, and by that we mean the steering wheel you turn isn't really mechanically connected at this point um, to, to the rack and pinion um, that actually operates the rods that turn the wheel. Uh, our throttles have not been connected by cables uh, for a long time. Our brake systems now interpret um, our movements on the brake pedal um, as much as they're actually mechanically just translating them. Um, we've got vehicles that uh, many, many new cars, depending on the trim level purchased, have backup cameras. Um, they have lane departure warning sensors. They have active speed following control. Um, we've got automatic day-night mirrors. Um, we've got vehicles that will help you parallel park or will, or will actually park the, 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 themselves. We've, we've had vehicles off and on for years with four-wheel steering. Um, all of these functions have been discrete. At some point, it will be relatively easy for automakers to knit them together. So in actuality, car makers don't really view Google as a threat. Um, they're a little bit irritated, of course, by public response to the Google cars because you have some consumers and certainly some on agency side saying, well, why don't you bring this out? And the car maker response is, frankly, that um, drivers aren't ready, laws aren't ready, infrastructure isn't ready, and they're not really certain of consumer demand at this point. So what automakers will continue to do is just deliver more of these technologies in discrete ways. And um, to Terry's point, we're going to have an equity, uh, a social equity issue here because new cars and expensive new cars are the ones that are going to get these technologies first. That's always the way it is. But to the extent we begin to plan our infrastructure around them, we've got to realize effectively we'll be planning our infrastructure around new cars for wealthy people. And that's problematic. Um, and the flip side of that is, the cars that are being sold even today that, say, aren't automated are meant and regulated to last much, much longer than cars were 20 or 30 years ago, primarily because of safety regulations and emissions regulations. So if we think about the legacy vehicles that will be in the fleet by 2020, we might have vehicles that stay in, in the fleet for 20 years. So if you've got economically disadvantaged people in vehicles that are not autonomous, and those vehicles are in great shape and are going to live for 20 years on the roadways. And we've got a few people, if I can use uh, you know, Lexus here as the brand to pick on, if you've got a few people in Lexi that are potentially fully autonomous, but those people are very wealthy and those vehicles are brand new, um, from an equity standpoint, how are we going to grapple with this? I'm going to jump to some questions that we, we finally got the question box up here. Uh, I'm going to group a few questions together here regarding what, what are the current policies going on, whether state DOTs are considering this, and uh, what are the lessons going on in Europe. Uh, state DOTs, Florida and Nevada have actually explicitly licensed these, uh, have started a licensing program to, to license vehicles and to start testing them on the road. So again, this is the kind of very, I think, a very positive uh, kind of approach, which is uh, with caution, but get, you know, getting the things out there. Uh, Europe is actually putting a lot of funding into demonstrations and tests of platooning of vehicles, and this would be the ability to get cars to communicate with each other and, and drive in platoons. Again, technology is very promising. 
uh, but getting it regulated, getting it into consumer shape is, uh, is a different matter. However, the Japanese and the Europeans are a bit farther along in that regard because their auto manufacturers are participating in these funding studies. And so we're thinking about uh, Volvo is, is doing quite a bit of platooning, and in Japan, Toyota is doing platooning. And again, platooning is getting the vehicles to talk to each other so they can safely drive very close distances. Um, so uh, going back, uh, there was another question about some of the features in uh, how they would best, uh, whether there are autonomous features that do serve pedestrian and, uh, and close urban environments. I'm going to toss that over to Chris. Sure. Um, it, in, in terms of the technology in vehicles, one of the um, technologies we see deployed already or soon to be deployed are, are things like assisted braking, uh, collision avoidance systems, and so it's it's not inconceivable that if instead of fully instead of a fleet of Google cars, we see cars where where more and more of the cars have collision avoidance. Um, and and a, an analogy I like to give are are car navigation systems. And if you think back um, 20 years ago, uh, if anyone had a car navigation system, it was a very high end car. Now I can buy a, a GPS unit for $99 um, at Best Buy, and and we see more and more cars having navigation units and Bluetooth units and the like. So within the the urban environments, I, I see quite a bit of promise for for either assisted braking, uh, collision avoidance, um, or, or other systems, and um, which may uh, cut down on some of the bicycle and pedestrian collisions. Okay, I'd like to take another question. Uh, one of the questions said, uh, all of our scenarios assume that uh, urban environments are going to be getting denser and more populated. What if it isn't the case? Um, and I, I would answer that from the regional point of view. Um, again, going back to that, uh, that huge range of density that we're going to see, um, you know, for the last 30 years, we've sometimes been thinking of uh, rural, suburban, and urban. And those are only three buckets. And we are, we're really, at the regional level, again, in our MPO planning, really trying to have a much more fine-grained approach. And so within that urban, there should, there should be, you know, seven or eight buckets. And some of those buckets are, are going to become more populated but not more dense. Others may have very different changes. But within those buckets, there are definitely going to be areas in the country, in most of the major regions, that are going to be getting denser, only because uh, they're currently constrained by rules that apply to suburban areas, and those rules are slowly being lifted. And so the, the, the sheer mechanics of, of the creation of, of, of housing and, and office and employment mean that these expensive areas, if you lift their barriers on parking, are going to, to just get more populated. And, and it's a trend we've seen for the last three to five years. Um, again, it's not going to be universal. It could only apply to sort of, you know, square miles here or there. Uh, but we definitely think there are areas that are going to have this. And so the question is, how will they respond to this vehicle mix? Yeah, Mark, I just want to add that uh, a lot of the lessons still apply regardless of where you are. Uh, and so you can imagine if, if you're in a rural area and there are a handful of autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles sharing the roads with older legacy cars, some of the lessons still obtain. Um, it's going to be... Um, it's something you need to be aware of. It's something you need to plan for. It's something you need to be cognizant of, um, and it's it's just going to make make um, you know items more complex, whether it's a rural, suburban, or a, a very urban area. There are a number of questions about interface between uh, and and you know we're not just talking about autonomous vehicles. As Eric pointed out, there's a whole lot of changes in vehicle type uh, that could come in over over 20 years. Um, and, and so talking about the range of vehicles and their integration with transit. Uh, transit's interesting. You know, transit and freight are very good candidates for a lot of this technology because they will benefit the most when you consider uh, the, you know, the risk and driver risk uh, and, and their ability to possibly, and again, this becomes a labor issue, possibly, uh, you know, drivers be more like operators rather than drivers of vehicles. Uh, but the problem is they have the longest fleet turnover. So the innovations have to be even more robust, and 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 so there are uh, there are cases of transit vehicles being adapted with with this kind of jam assist to increase headways, and if they have jam assist, the idea is that within that 20-year time frame, we probably will see at the at the at the electronic level more communication between vehicles. So um, you could have vehicles again not 
automatically driving around cars, but just communicating with transit and possibly benefiting from the traffic information that transit coming the opposite way may have. Yeah, and, and we've seen examples in Europe of some autonomous, I would call semi-autonomous transit vehicles, where the, as Marco said, the, the person's not really the driver, he's more of an operator to make sure nothing goes wrong, uh, but the transit vehicle could operate by itself. Um, and in particular with transit, I, I do want to raise the issue that um, uh, transit agencies get a lot of their funding from state and federal governments. And we've seen recent turnover in bus fleets to go from diesel and gasoline vehicles to CNG and other uh, alternative fuel vehicles. So if this is a, a policy that, that what various agencies would want implemented, uh, it would be possible to, ascent, to incentivize uh, the adoption of this technology if the funding's available. We had an interesting question about the, uh, the, the range of variety of cars and how that will impact the fueling systems. Um, and, and I'll start this off. Uh, SCAG is currently funding a major study looking at electric vehicle readiness. And again, that's really only one of a number of different type of fueling uh, scenarios. The experts in our group uh, involved with the, Southern, uh, the Auto Club of Southern California and, and Eric's contribution, they, they, can, they uh, have confirmed the internal combustion engine and gasoline will be with us as the predominant fuel source for uh, the foreseeable future. But vehicles have uh, a lot they can do to be more um, uh, better users of that resource, and we will see these other fuel mixes start to penetrate the market. Um, and uh, in the case of EV, uh, there's a lot of assumptions regarding whether this will look like a gas station or not. Um, and and some of the, the data is very preliminary, but we've found that most people think think about having to have uh, during the day fuel access to electricity. And then uh, in order to buy a car, um, less than 20% use it on any kind of regular basis. So it's a safety blanket, it's a necessary one, and then it becomes, you know, they really are charging at home with 120. Uh, 120 volts, that is, so um, uh, your basic wall socket. So that's one question, but we do have liquid, uh, we, again, getting back to the fleet question especially, we have this huge proliferation of, of fuels in, in the fleet. And so uh, my take is just as more people are, uh, getting involved in the sphere and more types of vehicles become available, we're just going to have uh, uh, a much more wide, diverse source of fuel. And, and I like to look at it generationally also and think about the fact that, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we really required a single standard. Most people are much more comfortable with multiple standards in play. You think about consumer electronics and payment options and things like that. So. As long as there's a, a base ability to refuel a vehicle, I think uh, some consumers are going to be okay with it uh, and at least willing to, to buy a car, which they know they can replace in, in you know, five, five years. That, that's my take on fuel. Uh, Chris, do you want to add anything or Eric? Yeah, and, and just, just a quick story. When we were talking to AAA about this, one of the issues they're, they're wrestling with is what kind of service vehicles do they buy? Because <laughs> right now AAA is really easy. If you run out of fuel, they send out a truck. It has gas or diesel and you're good to go. But do they, for example, have a CNG fueling vehicle? Do they have a quick charging vehicle? And so the, they're wrestling with these issues. And so we're uh, the only other thing I would add is that for some of these non-ICE um, technologies, the, the availability of fueling could very much influence their adoption. And so if, you, if, you, if you're not comfortable that there's an accessible CNG fueling station out there for you, you're less likely to buy a CNG car. Um, than a regular gas vehicle because you know you can always find a gas station. Yeah, this is Eric. I, the thing I would add to that is that um, some folks now, um, certainly um, at the, on the automaker side and also on the energy side, um, the gas patch, are taking the approach that probably the infrastructure that exists for fueling with, with conventional gas stations of you know, somewhere between 110 and 120,000 gas stations um, nationwide in, in the continental U.S., that probably can't be um, either replicated or beat, certainly. In other words, um, there are practical considerations that would prevent natural gas from having an infrastructure that even came close to that. Um, with regards to electric, field charging is extremely problematic. The economic model probably doesn't work very well, and perhaps most importantly, the batteries in battery electric vehicles don't really like a quick charge. It's very degrading. 
which is very expensive to the consumer. So the reality is a lot of these alternative fuels are probably going to be um, put back into the vehicle by the consumer at home. And that's natural gas and, that, and that's electric. And that starts to look a lot more like a plug-in model where the consumer charges the vehicle sun at night and takes off with it and runs on battery and at some point the vehicle just switches to gasoline. Uh, and please imagine also that same thing happening with natural gas. A natural gas vehicle being filled at night to some level, much smaller than a 200 mile range, you know, maybe only 40 or 50 miles on natural gas. And then at some point that vehicle just switching back over to gasoline. Both those scenarios exist technologically today. Europe, we see a lot of dual fuel vehicles. I think we'll see a lot more of them here. And it's precisely because the gasoline infrastructure can probably never be replicated again, at least not in our lifetimes. Yeah, we have a question here regarding the business relationship between users, vehicles, and roadways. And I'm, I'm really glad somebody asked this because I, I just finished my article about this. Uh, and, and, what, and, and this gets to what Eric was saying about the gas tax. And, and one of the things that uh, people within the transportation field are, are in pretty much agreement on right now is that the gas tax cannot be sustained as a as, as the single credible method for paying for our national uh, transportation infrastructure. And uh, the national infrastructure payments is really what kind of gets uh, uh, disseminated to the regional and local levels. So it's, it's, we're really talking about the same thing. Currently, SCAG is, is I, I don't have the exact numbers, but a, the a vast majority of its programmed money for transportation, both roads and transit, is sales tax, which, uh, which is definitely, from a policy perspective, not the best way to link usage with payment. Uh, but it does hit the entire base of the population. So this model, the current model we have right now is by everyone's uh, recognition uh, severely hampered if not broken and in need of reform. SCAG took the step of actually including a user fee into its modeling for the 2035 RTP with the understanding that something like this is going to have to happen at the federal and state level. So, so that, that becomes an issue for the next uh, um, uh, reauthorization. So, so you know, what we've developed over the years with the gas tax and with, you know, vehicles of, of varying capabilities is, is a complete separation of my concept as a, as a user of the marginal cost of how I get around. And so on the transit side, you know, when you take a trip, you pay for that trip. And that kind of inhibits you from, you know, taking each trip. And so transit is moving towards something like that where they're all trying to institute tap cards so that electronically you've paid for a series of trips. You've paid for your month's worth of trips. And uh, on the vehicle side, um, you know, user-based pricing could be instituted in as simple as a form as, you know, certifying your, um, your odometer reading every year when you, when you get to car register. And that would take care of a lot of privacy concerns, but uh, electronic tolling uh, and directly communicate like that, that has a lot of privacy concerns which are still being hotly debated. So uh, again, you, you have, right now we have a system where the, the infrastructure is not being paid for at the level that it's being used by the users, by the right users. Uh, and so, so just simply tolling everything is not the answer, but some combination of those things is is, is probably going to happen, and and again, also being forced by um, you know as electricity comes into play, how do you get people to pay for that? You know, how do you include? You know, if they do it at home, it's easy, but if they want to do it at work, that becomes a concern. So, um, so yeah, that that that's kind of uh, my take on the the, the pricing uh, and, and infrastructure issue. Yeah, and it, I think again, the you know our refrain is heterogeneity. You know, in some regions, uh, uh, tolling might be an example uh, where people are paying directly you know, more directly for their, role, their road usage, um, more toll roads. Maybe in, in California, we, we have the option of taxing ourselves through the sales tax of paper transportation, so that's what Marco is referring to. And, and in many areas of Southern California, it is the, I'm sorry, of California, it is the primary funding mechanism. And so the, again, as the technology changes and transportation and cars evolve, we think regions are gonna find uh, all sorts of innovative ways to pay for their, uh, the, their infrastructure needs. Okay, I think uh, we've, we've taken care of a significant number of questions. There's, there's one more um, question here on uh, ride sharing. And again, that, that's another innovation uh, that is, uh, you know, pretty much 
showing itself at this stage to only be viable within uh, dense urban environments. Uh, and what's interesting is that a number of the uh, uh, established rental car agencies are looking at models of how to get into this. Um, and there was a recent article where uh, GM's OnStar service is now partnering with a ride-sharing company so that you can actually unlock your car remotely and hand it over to someone. And ride-sharing went through a, a difficult period, but they have solved a lot of the insurance issues. So you, you are covered, the person is covered. I, I don't know all the details, but it's, it's consumer available and, and it's having rising acceptance. And so there's some interest in, in whether the GM taking this on would, would really uh, help the process. Because what was identified from the consumer point of view is that right, uh, vehicle sharing with your own owned vehicle, insurance was an issue and also handing off the key. So here you've taken care of two major consumer barriers. Uh, so we'll see over the next uh, number of years how, how this takes off. I, I know within very dense areas like San Francisco and, and Manhattan, ride sharing is very easy to use. And so when something's that easy, people people start doing it. Um, the uh, We're going to wrap up here. I think I'm just going to really quickly take a scan. Um, Uh, there, there is one question here, sorry, again, they're, they're kind of buried in here. Someone asked about, uh, and Chris kind of touched on this, but why don't we just restripe all of the infrastructure to multiple and segregated lanes? And uh, I think at the, re at the, the non-highway environment, uh, you know, when it comes to bikes having much more uh, developed engineered infrastructure, I think that's one trend we're seeing. Um, however, the idea of segregating all these different multiple vehicles on the roadway side, on the on the full vehicle side, it looks like we're actually going kind of an opposite trend into um, you know less lane striping, more kind of uh, attention based uh, vehicle. The, the, the concept of the Vunert from uh, Europe, where you remove all the signage in very low speed environments, and it, it forces people to make eye contact and rehumanizes driving, uh, and and that's showing a lot of promise. When people talk about that, they think they mean like citywide. No one's proposing that. We're talking about a couple of square blocks. Uh, and, and Chris, you want to talk about the, kind of the arterial experience, why, why you would or wouldn't necessarily stripe it a bunch of different ways? Yeah, and, and the, the challenge on the arterial is, is you oftentimes have to deal with turning movements. So, for example, let's say um, you put in a dedicated bus lane on an arterial. Well, the, the question would be, how would you then carry that through the intersection? Um, how would you carry that through? Um, you know, the various configurations, because it's not uncommon for arterials to add lanes or drop lanes, you know, to go from two to four, four to six, you know, six back to four. So that's where it becomes challenging. Um, if there is striping, you know, restriping done, we see it as being primarily focused on segregating the very low speed vehicles from uh, traditional cars, similar to putting in bike lanes. Um, there may be applications for transit lanes, but um, we think it would be problematic to systematically restripe um, arterials to, to add all these dedicated lanes. Um, and, and again, the, finally, you don't really have that many options. You know, on a, on a four-lane road, would you have one autonomous vehicle lane, one non-autonomous vehicle lane? Uh, and if you were to do that, how would you handle, you know, people turning the intersections? And, and again, just to highlight something that um, that Eric mentioned. It's, it's interesting in this conversation, one of the things we've seen is that uh, you know, the, the car design and, and production cycle is a 10 to 20 year long cycle. Uh, the infrastructure planning and design can be even longer than that, 25, 30 years. And yet at the same time, at the very local level, some dramatic engineering changes can be applied on a small scale uh, when really what you're talking about is the, the basic roadbed is already established, and so you're really resurfacing. So um, you have these two contradictory forces. At the big level, it takes years to plan and vet and environmentally clear some of these massive changes. At the small level, um, we're, we're dramatically changing the, the streets in the urban form to accommodate people, bikes, and vehicles, and so that vehicle range may be getting very much wider locally, uh, but it may not make that big of a difference because of the work that we're, we're already doing in that regard. Okay, I want to go ahead and... Um
show a, a, a final slide here just so you can kind of have some contact information about us. Um, okay, I'm again having technical difficulties, so. Okay, here's the uh, CARP Future Group. <laughs> The best way to get hold of us is through the website .org, to learn about the, uh, the the book project and again to learn about some of the uh, the, the other exercises and multidisciplinary approach that, uh, that the organization is taking. Uh, I've been very happy to be involved with it. Aha! Here are all the contributors to the book and some of the agencies and companies that we're involved with. Um, and uh, we, we, you know, really look forward to future interest and, and in, in kind of fostering these types of conversations. So uh, from everyone here, thank you very much. All right, thank you for uh, all the presentations and thank you for staying with us even through all the technical difficulties. And uh, that's it for today. And for those of you who are still in attendance, I just want to go through a few reminders. First, off to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast. Please go to planning.org slash CM. Select today's date, September 7th, and then select today's webcast, Car Street and Policy in 2035. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credit. Also, we are recording today's session, so you will be able to find recording of this webcast along with a six-slide per page PDF at utahapa.org webcast archive. This concludes today's session and I want to thank everyone again for attending. Thanks. All right, Ben. Well, are you still on the line? Yeah, I am. Uh, well, thank you very much, and apologize for the, the disastrous technology. It seems like a lot of people, I hope they can't hear me, but thank you for sticking on if you, you stuck with us, 301 attendees. <laughs> no. uh, thank you guys for um, just everything. All right. yeah. Thanks. Talk All right, thank you later. All right, thanks, Eric. Yeah, great, great job. Uh, is it possible to get a uh, list of the attendees? Uh, yeah.